Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're going to get started in about one minute. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Designing a Privacy First World in honor of Data Privacy Week. Now, please welcome NCA's Executive Director, Lisa Plagmeyer. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining Designing a Privacy First World. My name is Lisa Plagmeyer. I'm the Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. We are a nonprofit on a mission to empower a more secure interconnected world. Data privacy becomes a more central issue with each passing year, it seems, which is why just last year we turned Data Privacy Day into Data Privacy Week. Data Privacy Week aims to spread awareness about online privacy and educate individuals on how to manage their personal information and keep it secure. Data Privacy Week also encourages businesses to respect data and be more transparent about how they collect and use customer data. For the past six years, the National Cybersecurity Alliance and LinkedIn have partnered to host data privacy events like this one. We are thrilled to work with LinkedIn again this year to continue shedding light on these important topics. I'd also like to thank our 2023 Data Privacy Week sponsors, our platinum sponsor, Microsoft, and our silver sponsor, Optiv. So to kick things off, please join me in welcoming Chris Calabrese, Senior Director, Global Privacy Policy at Microsoft for a fireside chat on privacy trends, what's happening and why to work in privacy today. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me. So let's kick off our discussion with a bit of a level set. What is the big picture in tech regulation and privacy look like right now? Well, I mean, you really already touched on it. Technology has just become so central to our lives. Um, we're using it for more and more things coming out of the pandemic. But that means that the tech, the problems of the tech world have become the world's problems. So, you know, children's safety, you know, their access to social media, increasing automation and decisions about employment and health care cyber attacks and cyber warfare in the Ukraine, and just a general sense of control over our personal information. And so, oh, and of course, the rising power of, you know, you know, big tech companies, people certainly worry about those competition issues. So it's, it's really not surprising that we'd see regulators react to that. They're looking for solutions to problems. They're focused on what people are worried about. The result of that has been a real tsunami of regulation where we've seen privacy and data governance regulation, and then regulation across all of these areas. By the end of the decade, we at Microsoft think we'll look, the tech sector will look a lot more like banking or transportation, really regulated industries. That's how much things are changing. Yeah, so how are that tsunami of laws that you talked about, how is that changing the, the global landscape? Well, I, I mean, I think it's really, we're seeing real three real specific things. The first is we're seeing more comprehensive laws in countries. The second is we're seeing more regulatory scrutiny across the board. And the third is we're seeing sector specific laws aimed at addressing some of those particular problems. So when I talk about comprehensive privacy laws, I think everybody thinks of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe. And 
the GDPR has certainly been one of the lead drivers of this effect, and it comes out of a long line of regulations. There's been comprehensive regulation or legislation in Europe since the 1990s. But, you know, the passage of the GDPR kicked this regulation off, but it's now become a global trend. Um, we've seen the GDPR copied in Brazil and Japan and Korea and South Africa. Um, we expect to see continued engagement with comprehensive laws in this year. We will likely see a new law in India. We'll likely see updates in the UK, in Canada, Argentina, maybe Australia. So we're talking about huge swaths of the globe, as well as you know changes in the states in the US as well. So all of this means that we're seeing just more rules of the road around the globe. The second thing we're seeing a lot of is increased regulatory attention. Um, we're seeing big fines in the news. Um, we've also had enough time for the GDPR to sort of begin to have complex court cases wend their way through. And we're starting to see very sophisticated decisions about how the GDPR should be interpreted and what that means. And so all of this means more scrutiny from regulators and more guidance from courts. And then the last thing I'd say in terms of the tsunami of regulation is we're seeing sector-specific laws in a lot of places. Advertising has become a real target. The FTC actually described uh, targeted advertising as commercial surveillance in a recent filing. So there's, there's a real aggressive scrutiny there. We're seeing a lot of focus on children's privacy. It started in the UK with the UK's age appropriate design code, which is now called the children's code. It's spread to California and it's been adopted in the California AADC last year. And that's going to see more regulation of kids and their personal data. Um, we're seeing a focus on national security and the overlap between national security and commercial surveillance. This is most famously seen in the Schrems decision that everybody's heard about where we're seeing that, um, you know, the European Court of Justice uh, said that the, the former U.S. EU privacy shield had to be annulled because of concerns about data flowing from, from the EU to the U.S. And we're currently seeing negotiations underway to create a, a new framework that meets those concerns of the CJEU. And then just generally data flows. Um, more data is passing back and forth between countries. It's being used for everything from COVID response and finding new you know, uh, COVID vaccines to um, just business operations of all kinds. But countries want to assess whether it's okay to share data with a particular country and whether their legal protections are enough. And we're, we're seeing a real you know, questioning of those, the adequacy of those data flows. Um, and we need to move beyond kind of the bilateral negotiation, for example, between the e US and the EU and towards a more multilateral system where we can share data more broadly. That's something that we're going to start to see, I think, regulators, policymakers try to figure out in 2023. So what does every business need to know about privacy today? This, I, and I'd like you to especially touch on, um, you know, if I'm a small or medium sized business and I uh, uh, hear about the tsunami of regulation and legislation that's happening around yeah. the world, it's scary. And it's also the complexity is kind of mind blowing if you're an SMB. So talk to me a little bit about what businesses need to know. Well, you know, I don't want to undersell it. It's a lot. Um, I mean, I don't, I just, you know, there's no way to say, oh, don't worry about, it. I mean, I, I think the best I can say to you is it's time to begin to swim with the tide, right? You've got to embrace this reality. New regulation is going to exist. You've got to have that mindset. These technologies are becoming more central to how we do business. We've got to recognize that, you know, as much benefit as they bring, they also bring some harm and regulators are going to going to focus on that. So I think I'd start with trying to get your arms around your data. What do you need it for? What are you using it for? How long do you need to keep it? How are you keeping it secure? And really just have a sort of top to bottom discussion about your data. And of course, Microsoft offers lots of tools to do this. We're not the only ones. Lots of people do. But it's really something you don't have to do alone, but you do have to do. Um, I, I think the other thing 
that you that's helpful is if you don't think of it as all cost, right? There's right. a There's customer cost. benefit here. We, you know, consumers really have lost trust, frankly, in a number of these technologies over the last decade. T trust is def has declined 24 points over the last decade. And that's not just big tech. That's emerging technologies like crypto and blockchain and autonomous technologies. And I think this survey actually came out before crypto crash. So that tells you it's probably down even in more. So you've got to think of this as giving the customer what they want which is understanding and, and the ability to use this tool. And then I guess the third thing I'd say is that as much as I hate to say it, you begin with the GDPR, but you can't end with the GDPR. There are regulations around the world. They're not all harmonized. Um, certainly, if you're looking at the U.S. states, there's a fair amount of difference from the GDPR. There's also you know, regions like India is looking to sort of advance in its law beyond what's in the GDPR. And, and you've just got to kind of work with those realities and think about where you've got commonalities and think about where you can address differences. And then I guess the last thing I'd say is don't forget to tell your positive stories. Um, you have a front row seat on the benefits of this data. You can talk about how you're using it to quickly test for a COVID-19 vaccine identify a new way to reduce energy costs and increase sustainability. People understand the value of that. They understand that these are the things that they want technology to do, but it's up to you to highlight how you know, you're doing that and present the sort of benefits and costs in a nuanced way. So you've worked in privacy for um, some time and have a <laughs> successful career in it. Um, what should people know if they're considering a career in privacy? What's why is the privacy profession the the place to be? And and additionally, if I'm a young person listening to this right now, um, what what kind of skills do I need? What does this work entail? What kind of personality traits serve you well in this kind of field? Um, well, you know, I guess I'd start, I mean, I've just spent 10 minutes talking about how central technology and data are to our lives, right? And, and that's kind of part of the fun. I mean, privacy really impacts everyone, including me and you and all the people we care about. I mean, this data is creating an intimate portrait of our lives, details about how we, who we are as a person, when we go to church, when we go to, to, to a bar, what we're, who we're hanging out with, and it potentially can be shared with the government, with corporations, with researchers. And so it becomes really important to people. And that makes it pretty important to me. I mean, I really love to come to the office every day and think that, or, or the virtual office, I guess, sometimes, and, and feel like I'm really impacting, impacting the, important the important issues, issues that, people that people are focused, are focused on. on. So, that's the personal side. Professionally, it's a really hot space. The growth has been phenomenal. I mean, I can't believe that the IAPP has more than 50,000 members in just 20 years. I mean, that's just, I, I remember when the IAPP was sort of a, a group of people sitting around a boardroom table and it's just grown so fast and it's, it's great to see. These days, there's an old, it's become a cliche that every company is a data company. But it's a cliche because it's true. In order to grow and serve our customers we ha and find new sources of in innovation, we have to make good uses of data. So that's all really cool. And then it, to kind of turn to your question of skills and, and what you need to do to be a privacy lawyer, I think one of the things that's neat about privacy, at least for me, is that it's still being figured out. It's, it's a really new area of law we're talking about. I mean, my, most of my job is focused on literally looking at new laws as they're being passed and new regulations and trying to figure out what they mean and, and you know, how they can be shaped. And that, so that, that tells you how nascent some of this stuff is. You, as a privacy lawyer, you can be part of that conversation. Um, in some areas of the law, you just apply the law to the facts. For, the, for privacy, this is all fairly new and we're all trying to figure out exactly what it means or what it should mean. So that changing environment 
gives your career a chance to evolve. You can be a lot of different things. Are you interested in shaping laws and regulations? Go into policy. Are you interested in helping interpret these new laws and figure out how to apply them in complex, highly technical situations? Go into compliance. Are you interested in learning how these laws are being enforced? Go into investigations or litigation. All of this, I think, means that anybody can find a home for themselves in privacy, and it's meaningful and exciting and challenging work. It is exciting. And thank you very much for that conversation, Chris. That was great. It's wonderful. Now, I'd love to talk about it. Thanks. Thank you. Now, please welcome Carl Fishkit, Vice President of Data Governance and Privacy and Protection at Optiv, as he moderates our panel, Globalization of Privacy. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. And thanks for uh, kicking us off with that great uh, discussion with Chris. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Carl Fishkin, and I am Vice President and General Manager at Optiv, which is a cyber advisory and solutions company. And um, as was just said, I, I manage our data governance, privacy, and protection services practice. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be moderating today's panel discussion on the topic of globalization of privacy. And I'd also like to thank the National Cybersecurity Alliance for having us here. I'm joined today by three distinguished guests. Lara Kehoe Hoffman, Senior Fellow, Future of Privacy Forum and former Chief Privacy Officer, Netflix. Will Higginbottom, Chief Data Privacy Officer at the International Finance Corporation. And Rita Himes, General Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. So thank you all uh, for joining me. And um, I'd like to start today by just ask each of you to introduce yourselves um, and to share what events or experiences have shaped your perspective on privacy. I want to give the audience some context and background on your points of view. So I'll start with you, Lara. Sure. Thanks so much, Carl, and, and thanks very much for having us. Um, I'm going to preface this with uh, my comments today are my own, uh, based on my general privacy professional experience and, and should not be attributed to uh, any uh, entity or company. Um, I have worked with several global companies. Uh, I'm a first generation American, so I, I come from a multinational background. Uh, and I've traveled a great deal internationally. Um, folks who know me well know that I love cats. I'm very much a cat person. And I'm convinced that um, earning a cat's trust, as well as cat wrangling, are really essential skills to uh, that translate well to responsible data management. Uh, so that, that's the perspective I bring to this. Excellent. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Will? Great. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So, so my name is Will Higginbotham. I'm a senior counsel and chief data privacy officer at IFC, or the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the, the World Bank group. So the, the perspective that really kind of comes to me is um, from really working in somewhat of a unique institution where we are an international development organization, kind of centrally governed by our member countries, including you know, in the area of privacy through um, you know, coming together in our board. But at the same time, all of our work is in developing countries and we focus on the private sector. So our clients are going to be private sector, uh, you know, entities investing in those countries. So having that kind of both sides of the development institution, but working with the private sector is really an interesting perspective that uh, I think about a lot in privacy. Excellent. Thanks, Will. Yeah, definitely a, a unique perspective. Uh, and Rita, please. Well, thanks for having me. Happy Data Privacy Week to everyone. Uh, we started off today with Data Deletion Day here at the International Association of Privacy Professionals, a, a exercise that the entire company has to go through to get rid of just unnecessary files and emails and other things. It's a very cathartic and very exciting uh, annual holiday for us. So um, we're already off and running. Um, Rita Hymas with the International Association of Privacy Professionals, where I'm in-house general counsel and chief privacy officer. And I was thinking about this question uh, for quite some time in advance of today. And um, I think the concise answer is that I have a favorite fit, and that is the fair information practice principles, and that is the data minimization one. Um, they're all important. But I think if you can uh, embrace the idea of minimization, um, it can have a radical and profound and wonderful impact on everything else that your organization does. It, it eliminates the risk of all sorts of things going wrong. And it's just a good uh, philosophy for life. Um, 
if you can deal with less, if you can still do good work with less, you're consuming less, you're taking less. Um, and, and it sort of contributes to an overall philosophy of, of consume as the least amount possible um, on this planet. And I think that works for privacy when it comes to data collection. So, so that's my um, teaching moment for myself was that I, I have fallen in love with data minimization. And I, and I think it's, an, it's important for, for the practice and for every organization thinking about privacy. I, I love that, Rita. Thank you for sharing that. That, that really is great. Um, so I want to I want to dive in a little bit into privacy regulation, right? Let's kind of start at a high level and layer this on. And we've seen significant momentum in global privacy regulations going into effect over the past few years. Um, so, Lara, I want to start with you and ask you, what do you see as the driving force of these regulations? Sure. Um, I think essentially, Carl, it, it anchors in the desires to participate and to protect. Um, and what I mean by that is if, if your government, if your country uh, is going to participate in, in regional or global economies dealing with cross-border data flows, there's an expectation for your legal system to address privacy and data protection. Uh, that's table stakes. So we're seeing new laws, a lot of which are GDPR inspired, but there are variants and it's really important to understand what those are. Um, that said, I also think there's a real desire to protect. And these laws set the expectation that data leaving your borders is going to get the same level of protection as it would locally. Uh, and if it doesn't, you're going to have the ability to enforce against that. And um, in addition to that, though, we're seeing data localization laws, and there's no one form of those. They, they, they have different flavors you're seeing legal approaches to data ownership that are designed to protect local economic interests. And it's important to, to understand those specific drivers for those specific laws. Uh, and I think finally, there's also an increasing overlap of laws blending privacy and consumer protection, addressing what responsible data management looks like for certain activities and in regard to certain classes of individuals. And, and the headlines we're all seeing right now are in regard to minors and the use of AI. Yeah, thank thank you for that, Laura. Will Will you you know you obviously come from a, a different perspective in some ways about the global nature of, of regulation. What are your thoughts on this? Sure, and and I, I do think I would definitely echo that the cross border data flows and, and those issues are are really you know driving a lot of this with GDPR being kind of duplicated or replicated or put in place so that you can have those transfers to the EU being being a big piece of that. Um, I also think just public awareness, and it's kind of started in the more developed countries, but it's moving to the developing nations where we work of the privacy, high profile privacy misuse cases or the fines that are going on or how pervasive AI and new emerging technologies can really be into reaching in and, and seeing your personal data, what people can do with that. That awareness is just, spreading around the globe and as that does the public and regulators are reacting to that and 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 looking to put things in place and um, i think one thing that's been interesting we've we've seen is that there are a lot of um of the countries where we work that are on the you know developing emerging market side that may have had some kind of regulation in place a law on the books but there was no framework to enforce it there was not an actual regulator in place or a data protection supervisor authority or, or something like that and we are seeing you know, those things start to come to life. So maybe a law that's on the books is actually starting to build a, uh, a framework around actually enforcing it and putting regulators in place. And, and so kind of, you know, in steps, that's kind of the first step on the developing side to actually start looking at that regulation and actually enforcing what you have. And then this modernization kind of led by, you know, looking at GDPR and some of the things they're doing in the EU often, but updating their laws to match that, whether it's to encourage the data flows or to protect data in the country, but, um, you know, start enforcing it, then start moving it towards that modern edge. And it's, it's flowing through from the more advanced economies everywhere in the world. You know, Will, I'd like to pick up on something you said there about, you know, how do you as, as a chief privacy officer, how do you handle the multiple global privacy regulations, sometimes conflicting, right? Where do you start? How do you go about addressing that? Sure. So it's uh, definitely a, a, a major issue to, to look at. And I think one thing, you know, that maybe um, is different about IFC than would be for many of the people uh, listening and working in the private sector is that 
you know, we have a collective governance model. So our, our member countries come together on our board and set down the policies for us to follow and, and what we need to do. And so one thing that really is an advantage that, that we have is we have a global policy that's been adopted by all of our member countries that kind of sets down these seven core principles of this is how we think about and treat personal data on a global level. And a lot of work, you know, I was on the working group working on that went into making sure we picked up on the core principles from not just GDPR and some of the well-known frameworks, but all regions of the world, looking at the APEC frameworks and looking what they're doing in Latin America and other parts of the world so that we can say, these are our bedrock principles. We're going to take them with us wherever we go around the world. Um, our private sector clients are regulated by many different regulations in different areas. So you have to adjust and work with them on that. But to have those core principles as the uh, kind of starting point um, really kind of gives us that focus uh, to, to say this is where we're starting from and we, we can adjust as our clients need from there. Excellent. No, I, I think that's some good insight. Rita, I'm going to put the same question to you about, you know, addressing multiple global privacy regulations to address and, and where do you start? Yeah, right. Awesome point. And I think uh, Will's comment reflects my, what might be a, a principally a business to business model where you are working with a very sophisticated business client who's interested in maybe giving you their customer data. But if you are an enterprise that is collecting data directly from customers, um, and then it depends on how you're collecting that data. Many, many organizations are doing uh, data collection directly from customers through a website and chopping up their customers into where their customers live and providing them with a different privacy experience might be untenable. It might be unaffordable, frankly. And so then you're really looking at some of the things Will just pointed out, not to be uh, too pragmatic about it, but where is their law in the books and where are their enforcement authorities who have both taken the time to interpret it, but also have the authority to really do something about it and, and how sophisticated are the customers in that region? Um, it, it must be admitted, I think, that the GDPR really set a standard for most B2C companies on how to deal with data collection directly from consumers. It's not the only standard, but for many enterprises, it provided a baseline um, that then can be adapted as other regions come along. So that's my practical answer. Does that, does, and does that make it easier then on a B2C company or as a chief privacy officer to, to, to kind of work, work <laughs> the globe? I'll put it this way. It's easier to try to adopt uh, the most stringent privacy standards and apply them globally than it is to set a different standard and then upgrade uh, one customer at a time. Again, that's the assumption that the GDPR is the most stringent privacy standard, and there are some areas where that may not be true. But absolutely, a one-size-fits-all is cheaper, to be honest, for us. And as well as the International Association of Privacy Professionals, our members are privacy pros. They know their rights. It seems a little unfair to give to someone in Maine, for example, that doesn't have a state law, giving them access to their data or deletion rights, fewer rights, if you will, than someone in California or someone in France. So I think it's a great idea to provide these rights to all your customers if you can afford to do it. And as I said, once you've made these systematic processes, it's actually more efficient to give everyone the same experience. Laura, you want to? Add anything to that? Yeah, you know, I agree with everything that Rita and, and, and Will said. I think essentially it comes down to you need to think very carefully about resource allocation, product design, and scalability. Um, and keeping in mind all the principles and, and excellent points that Rita and, and Will just made. Excellent. So, Laura, I'm going to stay with you on that. And so how do you then... So how do you see these regulations then driving the consumer experience, right? And, and how do you offer a consistent consumer experience when you're dealing with all these different laws? Yeah, um, it's tricky, right? Because as a general rule, there's flexibility in how to get from A to B, because a lot of these laws will have uh, what I call aspects of gray in them. Uh, they, they provide principles, but not really rigid, tick the box uh, ways to comply. And that's good. That's what you want, because different businesses need to have different approaches. Um, but I'm going to anchor in something that Rita said, and that that's I would suggest setting the same expectations for all of your customers. And I'm, I'm focusing here, obviously, on more of a B2C reality. 
Um, but why not go ahead and give them the same data subject rights? Uh, there are frankly future proofing advantages to that approach. You build a single process and when, for example, the access right gets expanded into a new country or a new state, if you're focused on the US, you're largely covered. And, and that leads again to consistency of consumer experience. Um, and uh, happy consumers leads to less complaints generally. Um, now keep in mind, there are government laws and regulations, but then there are also platform requirements uh, that are, are, can be imposed on you if you want to participate within a platform. And platforms are generally going to expect you to meet their requirements globally. So a little bit of good practice uh, in terms of scalability. Absolutely. Rita, same question for you. Um, remind me of the question. Is it how sure. you know, these regulations are driving the consumer experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, for, it depends on your consumers, of course. And I do think there's room for um, some enterprises that are principally in, in a single domain and in a buyer beware environment like the American um, privacy context still is, in my opinion, a lot of opt out rights, a lot of notice and choice that is, quite frankly, just waving something in front of someone. I mean, if you're in that environment, uh, it's hard to appreciate an incentive to over comply to give to give the consumer more than they need. Appreciate you'd have a difficult time as a privacy professional convincing the business to turn away data if, if you didn't have to. So that's the practical answer. Um, but, and I think it's something we'll talk about later. I think that uh, if you can offer the consumer a privacy sensitive experience, they might be surprisingly delighted <laughs> to have it. And really what that is, is real choice and not uh, fake choice. Um, I think that consumers will, as again, just to, once again, to echo Laura now, um, that's future proofing your website too. When you begin to sort of parse processing operations into smaller pieces and, and get your consumer to really understand what they're giving you and what they're getting in return. Um, all of that, especially if you're redoing your website or revamping a, a mark, a, an entry form for lead generation, every chance you can get where there's a data collection opportunity as the privacy pro to advocate for clarity, transparency, and consent, real consent, I think you will uh, later be very grateful uh, that you built those systems early on. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, really. There's something that we talked about when we first met about the technology and the innovation that comes with that and the enablement of those types of things that you just referred to, right? And and what are those technology disruptors and-, and Yeah, enablement? I wish that, the, that every industry out there, every web tool that you might use had the kind of sensitivity that the four of us have. Uh, I, it's not there yet, I'll be honest. Um, the IEPP is working on a web modernization project. And as you look for vendors, there's a mixed bag on sophistication of appreciating the level of privacy that we as an organization expect to provide our customers. And we're finding that we're educating a lot of our suppliers along the way. They're grateful and they're willing partners and they are revising their systems to meet our requirements, but they don't come out of the box necessarily as sensitive to privacy and data minimization um, and consent and other things that you would that you would hope today. So I would say there's a lot of tech out there, but there is not to date a great deal of extensive privacy sensitive technologies that are in your bread and butter out of the box applications. So we have room to you know work to do and room to grow. That's not the privacy industry, by the way. I'm just talking about the rest of the of the tech sector. Yes. Sounds like an opportunity for some uh, tech tech companies out there. Um, so, well, something Rita mentioned in her her initial comments, where it was about you know privacy operations and operationalizing this, and, and you know I wanted to ask you, you know, is, is when maintaining privacy, is it better to localize operations, or is it possible to have global operations in the regulatory environment? I think this picks up on some of the stuff you've commented on earlier. Sure, exactly, and you know. Obviously, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, IFC is kind of a more business to business. So that probably will impact some of this. And we have as a the centralized kind of privacy policy that we that we look to. So so for us, it makes sense to have a centralized data privacy function, but also, you know, having the feelers in, in localization as well. And, and kind of what I mean by that is 
the data privacy office at IFC, the way we've said it is, it is a central office and we want things to kind of flow through here to make sure there's consistent application, interpretation of our policy and the procedures and that we're doing um, as consistent as we can across the global operations, the 100 plus countries that we operate in. But at the same time, you know, those 100 plus markets and the private sector clients we have, have different requirements. And so the way we kind of try to balance that is there is a central office that we want things to flow through, but we also have um, what we call privacy coordinators in every business unit around the world that is, receive additional training and have the liaisons between the data privacy office and they can bring us local specific issues and problems or issues that we run into there. We also do extensive training with our global legal office because they're the those project lawyers who are in there doing the projects in the countries, you know, giving them that training to recognize when an issue comes up and, and kind of bring us in. So yes, we have a centralized, we think of that centralized uh, market uh, office helps to make a consistent interpretation, but it only works by having all these tendrils and different groups and people kind of trained up to identify the issues and bring us in at the appropriate time. But we try to get that balance just to make sure we're being as consistent as we can across the globe, recognizing that there's going to be different expectations in different markets from our from our clients and partners. Thank you. And Laura, if I could, just I'm curious in your reaction to what Will's suggesting coming from a B&B &B versus a B2C perspective. Yeah. Um, in a in a in a B two B set right here, obviously you're you're accommodating your customers who have to accommodate their customers, and B two C that all falls on you. Um, and so, I think it comes down to, to to demonstrating to your customers um, how you're providing transparency, how you're providing choice, how you're providing control. Um, and and to do that, you basically you have to build trust directly one on one. Explain what you do. And then meet those expectations by doing what you say. And if your explanation for how you collect and use data isn't credible or comforting, at best it's going to be hard to consume, and at worst it's going to be scary and creepy. And and neither of those are are, are good results for for your customers or for your bottom line. Um, and the essential explanation should be the same whether you're talking to customers, the press, or regulators. It is the same story throughout. Slightly different different ways in which you engage and explain, but it's the same thing. And essentially you want the takeaway to be um, to the best you can, your practices are expected and non-controversial by reasonable standards. Uh, but for more novel data collection practices and uses to get back to something that, that Rita was touching on earlier, um, you ideally want the takeaway to be, this is new, but I understand what you say you're doing as well as the choices I have. And so to be clear, from a business perspective, that doesn't mean you need to stay static. You don't do one thing and just keep doing that thing uh, because businesses change and grow all the time by introducing new products and new business models. But it, it's a little bit of, of wash, rinse, repeat. As you introduce something new, explain it. Use plain language. Use a, a layered approach that lets you provide additional information. Um, have a centralized account page or uh, an app settings section that makes it easy to find controls. Uh, and I'm a big fan of doing consumer research to understand what it is your consumers want and find helpful. After that, uh, it's about behaving consistently in a way that maintains trust. You mentioned consumer research. Do you do competitive research as well? Uh, research on what the competition is doing, aka benchmarking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You should absolutely do that. Um, and, and it's great to do that, particularly as you're thinking about interpretations of existing laws and enforcement patterns, right? Those are three things you want to look at. Uh, what does the law say on the books? What is the enforcement pattern behind the law? And then what is the benchmarking? And what you'll often find is there, there's a range like this. Um, and this being most conservative and being least conservative, but, but within the spec of the law. And if you're somewhere in the middle toward the more conservative, probably fine. If, if this is the least conservative and you're close to here and all of your core competition is over here, that's the thing you're going to want to think about because you, you start to stand up. You're the blade of grass that's a little too high and the mower is likely going to come for you. Will, I'm curious on the B2B side. Do you look at the same thing, competitive and consumer bench, you know, competitive benchmarks, and consumer research? Um, absolutely. I mean, benchmarking is 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 very important 
to make sure you know we're, we're hitting the market expectation. That's where we want to be, making sure that our clients and partners that, that we are using personal data and, and operating with it in a way that they trust and understand and kind of meets basically what the market expectation is. So the best way to do that is to make sure you're you're doing that benchmarking and keeping up with you know what the expectations are because they're changing. And you know I, I listened to the intro and you know it's a fast growing kind of new area of law. So things are changing so fast and new things are emerging. Um, so often that you really have to constantly be be watching and making sure you're kind of keeping up with what the where things are going and, and know where they're going. So absolutely. Yes. So Reed, I'm going to pivot a little bit to you here. And you know, from a privacy industry perspective, right? How has the industry benefited from the more globalized work and the globalized regulations? And if you could maybe share some examples that you've seen. Well. I think it's almost been created, if you will, by the globalized world. So we had, we do a privacy tech vendor report. We started one in 2017. So obviously there were tech vendors in 2017, but I have to say many of them had reacted, not all of them, but many of them had reacted to the draft of the GDPR, the finalized draft that came out with two years to basically get to your act together. Um, and then just over the span of 2017 to just 2021, I think there was an eightfold increase in the number of ent enterprises that we, we featured in our privacy tech vendor report. Um, anywhere from you know, a fairly large platform like OneTrust, which is assisting with things like cookie notification tools and um, providing you with your Article 30 registry of record and all these other behind the scenes, get your act together and organized um, platform um, to, you know, very small companies that are, you know, novice startups trying to solve um, the problem of cookie consent. You know, it's a Canadian company, for instance. Oh, we're better than Google Analytics because we don't even use cookies. So all of these things have, have grown in uh, magnitude. Um, I think to be depressing. There's a little pause because some of the uh, cash funding is dried up. So I don't think we're really in major growth mode this year. There's been some consolidation and some acquisitions. I think that's going to be the trend. But look, um, you know, Chris Calabrese was giving a shout out to the growth of the membership of the IAPP. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also growing uh, in the industry side in terms of how many enterprises are trying to help pros do their work. So um, not going away anytime soon, especially if there are more and different ways of interpreting privacy laws globally, then you're going to need more and more tools to help help you manage compliance. Great. Okay, so let's let's um let's pivot away from operations. Let's talk about value, right? And and privacy in terms of business value. Will, I'm gonna look to you first and ask you, can privacy be a business differentiator? I think so, and I and I certainly tell our, our business clients we're doing training awareness that it can be all the time to <laughs> to make sure that that they're you know really thinking about it. And, and where I think it can be a business differentiator is that you can build trust in your clients and partners. If they trust that you're going to treat information more appropriately, they they are more likely to do business with you. Or the reverse, if they don't trust you to to handle it the right way, then they're much less likely to be comfortable working with you. Um, and doing and doing the right thing. So we, you know, we think that our the trust our clients and partners have in us as a global development institution is so important. And treating any personal data they entrust us with appropriately is a business differentiator. And if we, if they don't think we're doing it the right way, that can really you know hurt what we're doing. So absolutely, uh, it can be a business differentiator. Rita, what do you think about the differentiation? You know what I think, Carl. Of course it is. Everyone should have a whole team oh, of privacy God. professionals. <laughs> and I laugh, but look, it, there's not a single person out there who hasn't had to deal with um, with the vetting of a new potential business partner and the, the, all of the questionnaires that go around to make sure that their their security protocols are all in place and they've met all of these security standards and they have all these certificates and whatnot. People have been vetting each other for security for a long time. And now <laughs> they're vetting each other's business partners for privacy compliance, for privacy sophistication. So absolutely in the B2B world, 100%, if you are trying to land a new client with your software tool or your solution, um, your business customers are going to want to know, I should hope, 
not only do you have a strong security team, but you also actually have a privacy team so that when we give our customer data to you, we know we can, uh, to use Will's word, trust you with that data. So it is for sure 100% a differentiator in the B2B world and the tech world for sure. On the business to consumer side, um, increasingly so because Sadly, there's been a lot of fairly prominent enforcement cases lately against ubiquitous tools. And that kind of information makes its way to customers eventually. They, they, they I think the sophistication of the average consumer is climbing. Um, it's not there yet, but it's getting better even in the United States. And so at some point, I think privacy will become an expectation of all consumers. Um, and therefore, uh, it will be a business differentiator, even at the B2C level. Okay, Lara, Rita just answered the question for you for the B2C. So I'll ask you a similar or related question. Sure. How do you see consumer sentiment towards privacy evolving over the next few years? Ooh, well, I absolutely agree with what Rita said. I, I, I think there's gonna be an expectation that data subject rights like the right to access, that's gonna become table stakes for doing business. Um, I also, though, think there's going to be increasing sophistication in consumers about how technology works. So things that today might be seen as deceptive or misleading design practices might not be in the future. And so there's going to be some ongoing education there. I think we need to be careful about it. We need to be thoughtful about it. But that, that is something I anticipate. For sure. Reed, I see you nodding. Are you agreeing? Well, I had never thought of that before. Um, it's a fascinating thought process that, or argument. I'm sort of pretending that we're in front of a regulator and you're saying, well, I understand that this design may have confused people five years ago, but today consumers are sophisticated enough to understand where their um, controls live within the app or where I could, they could find more information. Um, I love it, Laura, I'm hiring you. <laughs> That's outside counsel. <laughs> if I'm ever in a transparency pickle, that's really cool. Very good. Well, I appreciate the thoughts, you know, about the value of, of privacy. I, you know, it, it's it's what I what what I see also is you can't get away from it, right? It, it's no matter no matter where you turn, it, it's it's something you have to worry about, whether it's the legal or the financial or the monetization of your of of, of data or whatever it might be. You can't get away from it. So. I uh, appreciate your thoughts there. Um, so as we start to look forward, um, you know, to 2023 or we're in, you know, the rest of this year and into the future, um, let, let me start with, uh, with Laura, your, your thoughts on what priorities are on your 2023 roadmap with regards to privacy? What is or should be a focus area? Yeah, I'm going to say minors. Um, focus on minors if you are consumer facing, even if you think right now that they are not part of your intended audience, pay attention. Um, and if you're B2B and you're supporting customers, they might be dealing with minors or they're going to have to think about that. So uh, that would be my top priority just across the board. And, and how do you see the regulatory environment changing that you would then need to adapt to it? Do you see regulatory changes coming with minors, for example? Um, wow, well, that, that could be an entire conversation in and of itself. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm simply going to say, um, I, th I think there, there, there are two potential advantages to focusing on minors. One, it's coming. And, and again, it's part of that blend of privacy and consumer protection, uh, which I think is a trend that's going to continue. So start practicing now. Um, I also think there's some advantage to thinking about what are privacy controls you might want to provide to minors. And is there some reason you're not providing those to adults? So think about it as a crucible within which you can craft uh, new and better uh, approaches, which you can then expand to your entire uh, populace. Um, and that includes if you're a business that's got B2C and B2B elements to you, and there are a number of them out there. Um, you can think about using B2C as a way to build positive privacy practices. Um, the other thing I think about in terms of regulatory environment, just to pull it away from minors for a second, though, is I, I do continue to worry about data localization uh, and whether that's going to drive to further division of the internet and inadvertently undermine security for the digital economy. Again, and a whole other conversation we could have there. But um, I, I think uh, just taking it back to a global perspective, continuing to work really carefully to understand the concerns under, 
underlying specific data localization laws and addressing them in a productive way. Don't just blow them off, understand why they're, why they're coming up in the first place and then be prepared to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you for those insights. Will, I'm going to ask you the same question. What are your priorities for 2023 and what, what, you know, what is or should be the focus area? Sure. So, so my priorities for 2023, and they are often this each year is uh, awareness and training programs, you know, just making sure that we can have the, the finest policies and procedures in place. But if the operational staff and people out in the field doing it don't know, don't know what to do, what to look at or where to find the resources. So this year and every year, it's kind of a top priority and especially coming out of the COVID times we've had where we haven't been able to get out and visit our field offices and going places. We're going to spend a lot of time going to the field, seeing people, because making those face-to-face -face connections with the people working uh, around the world is really important. So a lot of focus on getting out and kind of doing that 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 training. Um, another thing that's been a focus of ours, and it's maybe a little bit broader than just privacy, but lo looking at um, incident response and preparing for you know things that, that might involve personal data and things like that. So you know, tabletops, that kind of thing, making sure we're ready in case the, what is increasingly seem like an inevitability, the, the incident comes to you and you have, uh, you know, you're ready to react. So we have some focus this year on just trying to make sure we're, we're in a position to, to do that. Those are kind of two high, high profile priorities we have uh, going forward right now. I'm curious, Will, so we, we, you mentioned you're planning some trips out to, to the field mm -hmm. um, and to work and do some training and so forth. What kind, of, what kind of questions do you anticipate to get from folks? I mean, are they welcoming you with open arms and they want to learn as much as they can? Or are you just a necessary corporate person coming down from the U.S.? So that's, I mean, the the, the messaging is really important to try to make sure they don't think you're just the, the person coming down from the U.S. And, you know, we talk about the very simple tools we make available that they can use to help identify privacy risk and communicate with the office. And try to you know make sure we emphasize why it's a business differentiator why it makes their life easier why you know coming to us early because generally privacy issues are pretty easy to fix before you go out and start collecting the personal data and doing something than they are when you come and ask me after you've already grabbed it and want to do something with it so you know emphasizing we're here to help if you come to us early we can make this a pretty simple efficient process if you come to us later it may be a bigger problem so just really emphasizing coming early, we're here to help, we can do it quickly, uh, particularly on the early phase is, is what we, we try to emphasize. Excellent. And, and you know, how do you see the regulatory environment changing in the future? So I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this question, um, you know, I, it's definitely going to keep growing bigger and bigger, but whether it's going to be harmonizing or people are different places like India we're seeing are, are kind of doing slightly different things, you know, I think it's, it's not quite clear. So I, I can't predict, but I'm interested to see how it goes in the future as far as are things going to kind of converge in a similar area? Are we going to get more and more, you know, particularly with the localization requirements that are popping up versus uh, in areas and in, in different countries. And, you know, um, so that's, that's one thing I'm looking at. And then just the emerging technologies, how that will be addressed and regulated going forward. And of course, by the time we start thinking about the ones we're thinking about now. There will be five new ones we haven't heard of that are coming along, but just seeing how those things are integrated in, I think will be um, really interesting. I guess time will tell. <laughs> Rita, question yeah, for you. Yeah, what I mean, we're almost out of time. So I would just say that I think we're all going to have to start calling ourselves data lawyers and not just privacy lawyers, because if you look just at what Europe's struggling with, you know, there is a, a, a fairly significant public policy Recognize, recognition um, that data is super valuable for all sorts of public good. I mean, you can harness it for finding pandemics and, you know, um, helping people be more healthy and, and doing transportation better. I mean, it's, it's extraordinarily useful to have access to data. And so, um, but, you know, there's fear around, you know, the uncontrolled use of data and personal data. So as regulators, grapple with the value and, and fear of AI, um, you know, as we think about wanting people to be open with their data so that we can all benefit from it. You know, there's just a lot happening in the regulatory space where all of these interests are kind of coming to uh, clash a little bit. And it won't just be privacy. It won't just be personal data. 
um, that will be at stake. We'll have to think a little bit more broadly about information and the sharing of information. So totally exciting time to be in this field for sure. And, and are, you will, are you willing to make a bet whether it's going to converge or diverge, the regulatory? Oh, no, I think they're going to fight about it for a long time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, there's some turf battles up ahead. I can see them from here. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Rita. <laughs> Look, Laura, Will, Rita, thank you all for your insightful comments, your participation today, and your thoughts on the globalization of privacy. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for listening and joining us uh, for this panel. And I believe we have Jennifer, uh, who will be joining us momentarily to take us to the next presentation on privacy by design. So thank you all. Great, thank you. Great, thank you, Carl, Lara, Will, and Rita for the great conversation today. And now please welcome Lori Craner, Director of the Carnegie Mellon Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory for Privacy by Design. Lori, I think you're muted. Oh, we still can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, okay. Can. Great. Sorry about that. Um, great. So uh, today uh, I want to talk to you about um, privacy notice and choice interface by design. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah, so uh, when we started uh, making privacy policies on websites way back in the 1990s, uh, one of the first thing people notice is they're really long and no one wants to read them. And even back in the 1990s, people started saying, mm, there must be a better way, next slide, and uh, thought maybe we could borrow some ideas from food nutrition labels. They have these nice, short, standardized notices that people don't seem to really mind and actually find useful. Next slide. Uh, and so uh, my students and I started doing some work on uh, trying to figure out what exactly would a privacy nutrition label look like. And we uh, took an iterative design approach where we came up with a bunch of prototype designs and we did surveys and focus groups and interviews. And we came up with this, this design that you see here which tested pretty well and people were able to use it to actually compare the privacy policies on websites. Uh, we wrote some research papers about it, but it didn't actually get uh, adopted, although some of the ideas uh, did make it onto a few websites. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we started looking at mobile apps and uh, trying to see if we could uh, do something like a privacy nutrition label for them. Um, and uh, Patrick Kelly, who was my student at the time, uh, came up with this privacy facts interface and he mocked it up um, for the Android app store. And we did a user study where we brought people in and half of them, we showed them our mocked up um, uh, app store with privacy notices and half just saw the normal app store. And we gave them an exercise where we asked them to help their friend uh, choose some apps to download, and we asked them why they made certain choices. And what we found is that when there was no privacy information in the App Store, privacy was not one of the things that factored into the equation. On the other hand, when they saw privacy facts in the App Store, a lot of people used it, and that was often the um, deciding factor in picking an app. Um, it wasn't the only factor, and if there was an app that was a brand that they knew, they'd use the app, um, or if it had like, a really good rating, they might pick it anyway, even if the privacy facts wasn't so good. Um, but otherwise, privacy facts actually made a difference. Uh, and this was back in 2013. Okay, next slide. Uh, so fast forward uh, to 2020, and Apple announced that um, iOS uh, privacy labels 
were uh, iOS iOS uh, apps were going to have privacy labels, um, and shortly thereafter, Google announced that Android apps were going to have data safety labels, um, and so those rolled out. And I was personally very excited because you know we've been saying for like a decade that apps should have privacy labels, and it would make it much easier for people to learn about privacy and make it more salient. Um, and then I saw the labels and I looked at them, and I was wondering, hmm. These aren't quite what I had in mind. I wonder if they're use usable and useful. Next slide. Uh, so I worked with a bunch of students and colleagues to uh, evaluate these labels. Um, so we started with the iOS labels and we started with a study with developers. So we worked with 12 iOS app developers and we watched them while they created a label for an app that they had developed. So an app that they were very familiar with. And what we saw is they made lots of errors in the process. Um, largely, we found that they were just confused about the terminology. They didn't know what tracking meant. They didn't know what data link to you was. Um, they uh, often just forgot about all of the data that the third party libraries that they included were using. Um, so the labels they created were not very accurate um, and kind of a mess. Uh, next slide. And then we did a study with end users to see how, how they did with the labels. And so we interviewed 24 iPhone users. Um, first, we discovered that most of them had never actually even seen the label, um, probably because you have to scroll down a bit in the App Store before you even see them. Um, once we told them they were there, they most of them were pretty excited about it. They thought they'd be useful. Um, but they were also really confused about the terminology. Um, they were also very confused about the structure of the label. They they thought the labels were redundant. Um, they're not actually redundant, but they didn't understand what they were looking at. And so it seemed to them that the labels were redundant. Uh, and they were also really frustrated that the labels aren't actionable. You know, they would see things in the label that they didn't like and they thought they should be able to opt out of. And in fact, in some cases they could opt out, but you can't just click something in the label to opt out. You have to go to a different interface to do that. Next slide. All right, uh, so uh, this is just um, you know one example of a privacy interface. There's also lots of privacy choice interfaces, and I'm sure you've all seen cookie banners and um, third-party advertising controls and uh, CCPA do not sell and all sorts of other privacy choice interfaces. Next slide. Uh, and... <clears throat> It's kind of uh, accepted, I think, that yeah, we have all these privacy choice interfaces, but you know they're they're not really very good. They're they're hard to use, and and people, you know, if if you even mention a cookie uh, interface, um, which I mention a lot because I do research on it, um, people will immediately tell tell me how much they hate them. Um, so you know these interfaces tend to be hard to find. They have hard to understand choices. Um, sometimes they require a lot of clicks. Sometimes they're actually deceptive. And sometimes users look at them and say, but they don't even give me the choice that I want to make. Next slide. Uh, so we we did uh, a number of studies on how to make some of these interfaces better. And from that, we distilled uh, seven criteria for how should you even know if your privacy choice interface is good. And so in plain English, here are the seven things that I think we should be looking for. One, does it actually address user needs? Number two, does it require minimal user effort? Number three, we want to make sure that users are aware of what choices exist and where to find them. It shouldn't be like, oh, if you dig somewhere, you'll find these secret choices. Um, number four, does it convey the choices and their implications so users actually understand what choices they're making? Uh, number five, does it satisfy users and engender trust? You know, do, do users you know, feel like it was a good experience making those choices and do they trust that their choices are going to be honored? Uh, number six, uh, does it allow users to change their decision if they change their mind or maybe they clicked on the wrong thing and made, made a mistake when they first uh, made their selection? And then number seven, does it avoid nudging users towards the less privacy protective options? And a lot of these choice interfaces actually pretty blatantly nudge users to do the thing that would be less privacy protective. Next slide. 
All right, so here's examples of lots of cookie uh, consent interfaces. You've seen them all. Uh, next slide. Um, and they have a lot of common problems. If you measure them against those seven criteria, which we have done, you find that um, a lot of them are nudging users to accept all cookies. They're requiring extra steps if you want to make other choices. And, um, and, and often those extra steps are, see, as you can see here, we've got a big button, accept all cookies, and then there's a link to cookie settings. And uh, it's not clear what's behind that link or how long it's going to take me to make the choices or if even the choices I want are there. And this is a pretty typical cookie consent interface in the United States. Next slide. Right. So uh, we did a big study to evaluate a lot of these cookie consent interfaces. We started by looking at 200 of them that were from the five major uh, consent management platforms uh, that are out there. Um, and then we did a user study where we, we came up with 12 cookie consent design variations based on common things we'd seen, and we um, measured them against six usability factors. Next slide. Uh, so we made this um, fake e-commerce website that sells cups, and uh, each user um, went to one of, of our 12 variations of this website. They thought they were just you know, shopping for cups, but actually what we were interested in was how they responded when the cookie prompt came up. Um, we had over 1,000 participants. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to show you all 12 variations, but here's a couple of them. Uh, the one at the top is one that um, was, was probably the best one that we tested. And you can see that it makes it pretty clear what they're doing. It has two equally weighted buttons for allow selected cookies or allow all cookies. And it actually has bo check boxes for all of the available cookie types right there. And then the one on the bottom was uh, one of the worst ones we tested. And you can see that all the text is run together in a big paragraph, and there's only one button that says OK. And if you want to do something other than accept all the cookies, you have to look in the paragraph and find that little link to cookie preferences and, and follow that. Next slide. Uh, we also did a variation where uh, we just had uh, in the corner um, a button that said cookie preferences. Um, and uh, if you clicked on it, then you would see the nice cookie banner um, that I showed you before. Next slide. Okay, so these are the results. Each bar here is, um, is one of the variations that we tested. And um, the important thing that I wanna uh, show you is that they're not all the same. These variants made a big difference as to which cookies people accepted. Uh, next, please. Uh, so there were a bunch of variants that are all pretty similar where, um, where people, about a third of the people accepted only strictly necessary and about two thirds accepted all cookies. Um, ne next, please. Uh, and then there was a bunch where almost everybody accepted all cookies. And basically what we saw is that if in our variations where, where we showed them all the cookie choices on the front panel, um, people were much uh, less likely to accept all cookies. Next. Um, and then we also found in that corner button or in any of the conditions where you could actually get to the site without having to interact with the banner, a lot of people just ignored the banner and went, went on uh, with their business at the site. Okay, next slide. All right, so I just want to wrap up here. Um, so as you can see that these consent choices make a big difference and they're also pretty burdensome. Users really don't like having to uh, deal with them on every website. Um, and so I think ideally we would find ways of reducing the burden by actually not having prompts like cookie banners. Um, we'd find ways of having more standardized interfaces. We would have um, user agents like your web browser that would have things built in where you could set your preferences up front and not have to deal with it on every website. Uh, we would have search tools that would let you compare apps based on privacy um, and say, hey, I, I want you to you know, show me the, the apps that do what I want and have good privacy. All of these things would really considerably reduce the burden of user consent. 
Okay, so I'm going to wrap up there. And um, uh, now I want to turn uh, to our panel. Um, we are fortunate today uh, to be joined um, by three excellent panelists. Uh, so, you know, I talked a lot about the user interface and the user side, and they're going to talk more about the engineer side of designing for privacy. Um, so we have uh, with us here today um, from Uber, I have uh, Nishant uh, Bajaria, uh, who's the Director of Privacy Engineering, Architecture and Analytics at Uber. And then from LinkedIn, I have Shovak Ghosh, who is the Director of Engineering AI, LinkedIn. And then from Microsoft, I have Victor Rule, who is the Principal Applied Research Manager um, at Microsoft. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so to uh, start with, I'm going to uh, to have each panelist uh, talk just for a few minutes um, to describe um, a privacy solution that they are focused on um, and perhaps a challenge that they are facing uh, related to privacy. Um, so uh, I guess let's, we'll just go in the, the order that I just introduced them. So we'll start with uh, Nishant. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kano, for having me here. So I think Every now and then there's a specific kind of verbiage or concept that takes a hold of the privacy security community. And right now I cannot go anywhere without hearing shift left or governance. Like those are sort of the topics people talk about. And I think this represents a huge opportunity for the privacy community because we've historically complained about laws that are not hyper prescriptive and scale that is hard to achieve given how teams are actually formed across the company that we worked in. So the opportunity here that I'm building towards is how do you create a new kind of privacy engineer that can work with the legal team, identify potential red flags early on at the design stage. So take the pressure of the PIA and DPIA process and not have the privacy review become a blocker. So that becomes step one where you truly embed privacy <clears throat> into the design, not just privacy by design, but into multiple design docs at the same time. What that tells me is I understand exactly upstream where the risks are forming Like what are the sorts of things I need to watch for. So rather than coming in with encryption or deletion or obfuscation or anonymization, differential privacy, at the warehouse stage, which is typically when we come in, we would build tools for deletion, detection, anomaly ver verification, monitoring, things like that at a pretty early stage. And those become tools that privacy engineering can build in-house and potentially provide to engineers across the company. So you have addressed the privacy risk to an extent at the product stage with the ERDs at the design stage. And you've used that information to detect those anomalies if your feedback was not properly taken. What this means is two things. First is the number of designs that will make its way to the legal legal team for review at the tail end will drop substantially. And second, you will build tools that are more responsive to the company's needs at heart. So as an example, if you are swapping encryption keys every so often to make sure that somebody on the outside cannot actually exfiltrate your data, you can use the same logic to change keys inside the company, which means all these engineers that routinely tell me, I swear I need access to all this data. You can swap the key and see, did anything actually break? So you can identify those people who always say they need data but don't. So what I'm trying to go for is if you are going to build proper data governance, if you're going to properly shift left, you got to do it with a mix of guidance, architectural guidance, that is, process and tools. And third is actual solutions that you deploy at the company-wide scale. So my guidance to everybody on this panel would be don't wait for top-down sponsorship and epiphanies to happen. You have to get into the process much earlier and in a way that may not look like it scales at the beginning, but you have enough incremental results to show on an ongoing basis. So that would be sort of my opening offering to this group. Great. And I just want to ask for one clarification. Can you tell us what you mean by shift left? So shift left, basically, if you imagine data coming into the company as a horizontal funnel, you got the narrow end on the left-hand side. And typically, privacy security are brought in on the far right of the funnel, either right before data egresses the company or right before it's archived. And the goal is, okay, here's your data, protect it, delete it, blah, blah, blah. And at that point, you have way too much data, way too little compute power, way too little focus. And you are addressing the problem after it's already been made worse substantially. So you're closing the door after the cats have fled the door. So what I'm saying is get in the conversation at the design stage when the ERD, that is the design docs are being written, get in the conversation at the ingest API stage at the very early process of the design architecture. And, and finally, build your tools in a way that will address and catch the data and enforce some policies. The goal here is to shrink the size of the funnel so that you start attacking it at the far left-hand side when you first collect the data. And then when you have to address governance again at the far right, 
the sample of data is a lot smaller and also the quality is much better so this is not just a privacy issue this is about having to pay less in storage costs having to pay less to encrypt data having to worry a little less about somebody taking data than you should have had to begin with so shift left is about getting into the game much earlier in the process excellent thank you uh shovik we'll turn to you thank you so I uh, lead a team called AI Foundations at LinkedIn, where uh, privacy is a key, key pillar. And with my team, I do spend a significant amount thinking about privacy enhancing technologies, which are helping embed privacy by design across the LinkedIn uh, uh, ecosystem. And uh, that includes a governance, processing of data, to all the way to product surfaces that include say analytics, insights, and machine learned models and whatnot. These are hard technical problems that uh, needs a solution. But I'll say one major challenge that uh, I face and that I am working towards solving is the fact that people underestimate the risk of privacy. Oftentimes, there is uh, happens to be a sentiment that if I drop this particular column from this data, we are good. If we aggregate this data in this particular way, we are good. But uh, oftentimes, uh, we don't know what's outside. Once we share something, once something is out, that can be joined with many other things outside and other information and we have no idea of. And that leads to an underestimation of the risk that uh, people have when they're making certain decisions. That I think is a big challenge that uh, we need to solve. Great, thank you. And Victor. Thank you. So um, as Laurie, as you pointed out, I'm a researcher as, uh, at Microsoft uh, working on uh, privacy in AI. So my point of view is uh, less from implementing a particular solution, but more on innovation around privacy and anti technologies uh, how do these tie into existing and upcoming regulations, but also how do we enable them in the ML life cycle, the machine learning life cycle? Um, so we're working across multiple teams in Microsoft, uh, researched and addressed questions around uh, how can we safely leverage uh, private data to enable more powerful and domain adopted experiences? So this is a wide range of applications, for example, um, from creating more powerful AI assistants to what was previously mentioned, uh, detecting uh, like diagnosis in healthcare setting for, for diseases. And I think there's multiple challenges in general in, the, in this field, not, not a single one, but I think a general problem is like innovation in AI happens incredibly fast. And typically privacy is, is, is not a first thought in this, and that's definitely something we want to change. And in particular, I think one hard aspect is I want to uh, I want to just spend a little bit of time talking more about is um, the training of uh, machine learning models, uh, which is more generally a black box. So we don't really have a lot of control of what happens to the data. So we train a model across multiple uh, participants, and we can't really accurately control what is happening to, to this data. So our work focuses around understanding and quantifying the risk uh, for these models, like what is the risk for these models to memorize and leak sensitive content, how can we leverage existing and new technology, such as virtual privacy, to, to mitigate that risk? Um, and in general, how do we bring uh, enable new technology to bring this whole um, privacy question as a, um, as a first principle into the ML design process? Okay, thank you. Great. So um, I have I have some questions here for all of you. Um, uh, so the first question I want to pose for people to think about is uh, how far can we go with technology to protect privacy versus having to just change um, policies um, or uh, governance structures or other other things within within the company? Um, so perhaps Shovik, you you could uh, take a whack at this. Sure. Um, I think all the panelists here are in companies which are operating globally in, in various uh, cultures uh, and uh, whatnot. And I think privacy is something that uh, the interpretation of that or how one perceives that, that varies a lot. And it's hard to get to uh, one single definition to some extent as well when it comes to how our members and customers are perceiving it. 
to get to that point, and there is the behavioral aspect, there's the emotional aspect to all of uh, these as well. So technology, I think, is a key piece. It's an important piece, but just by itself, uh, it's not enough. We, within companies and outside of these companies as well, I think we need uh, regulations in some places to define the basics. Like these are the table stakes. stakes. Then on top of that, I think, Laurie, you were mentioning in your presentation as well about education, like how do we uh, like educate people as to what does this mean instead of this long list of uh, text uh, using language that uh, people can understand. That is a key aspect of increasing accessibility in this. So we need to talk to our members about what we are doing. How do they understand that? So that is important. The, the other aspect is education as well, like for education for our members, what they can expect, and also all the product managers and engineers who are building product, and they need to understand what privacy means for that to be incorporated uh, into the product very deeply and not from the outside, as Nishant was saying that, okay, this is what we have created, here are the problems, go fix it. Like privacy, for privacy to be central to this thing, like people have to understand that. So. Yeah, uh, we need more than just technology. Okay, cool. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in and, and, and perhaps um, describe, you know, what, what are the parts of the problem that maybe technology can solve? Yeah, I can jump in here, Dr. Greener. So I think Shobik is totally right. This is a cultural shift that has to take place. For the last 15 years or so, we've told engineers it's going to be bottom up. You have to be innovators. You have to have your own tech stack or you don't have to worry about processes. Like it was amazing when I wrote code, I, it was all top down. And the moment I became a manager, it became bottom up. So I'm always late to the power party, if you will. But I think the techniques that have made us successful as innovators and engagement driven entrepreneurs in the last 10 years, minimal process, trust, freedom and responsibility, we still we should have those things. But I think we're going to have to require some level of central consistency and adherence to succeed in a way that doesn't have privacy become a blocker, because otherwise you end up with a situation where everybody builds for themselves and the composite image doesn't really fit correctly. And those things get addressed by throwing more people, uh, you know, having escalations, but you cannot escalate your way out of privacy and security. So building with that central view in mind would be pretty critical. Like you cannot have one team doing deletion correctly, another team holding on to data forever. So representing that at the end of the day, this is a shared platform. It's, a, it's like living in a condo association. You may not like the HOA, but you cannot have trash in your front porch. So people are going to have to realize that this is a shared resource. It's a shared obligation. And working towards that from the very beginning, that is another example of shift left. All the shifting left doesn't have to happen because of privacy people like us. It should happen mentally when people start building stuff that we probably never know about. Victor, yeah. do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I, I completely I, I agree on this. I mean. Technology is a key component, but it, uh, I mean, we also have to ensure that technology is applied correctly. We have to ensure um, that we leverage the latest technology, that people are aware of the technology. So I think that's that's a big part of the process. And um, also what has been addressed is the how, how do we talk about technology? That's really critical to build, to build up trust. So um, I completely agree on all of these points which have been said. Okay, great. Um, what about privacy by design frameworks? Um, do any of you actually use any privacy by design frameworks? And if so, which ones and how do you use them? Uh, Shovik, do you want to start? Uh, we, uh, so privacy by design is uh, a key component in our product design uh, process at this point. And uh, so it's uh, starting from uh, the picking of like, from the, the design of the project. So what would the data flows uh, look like? What would the product experience uh, look like? So those are reviewed and those are reviewed by, with the, the privacy uh, experts uh, in place. And when for existing uh, products as well, there are uh, reviews that happen from time to time and understanding how to put uh, things into perspective. and. The, what we are building her towards is a lot of automation in this uh, process, which currently uh, there is significant human in the loop and the human uh, expertise that is needed here with the proper governance technologies and in place and uh, 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 mechanisms to enforce the policies uh, being automated. I think that will uh, uh, take this uh, scale up these efforts a lot more. 
Anyone else? Yeah, what I've often found is I tend to not be able to tether myself to a specific standard simply because business has changed pretty quickly. And it's sometimes very hard to identify a certain standard. I, I see the attractiveness of being having a North Star to look, look back at. But what I would rather do is look at the best of GDPR, look at the best of CPRA, and come up with an internal abstraction that places engineering on such a high bar that what we build addresses both the regulatory compliance obligation, the industry you know, standard obligation, and the customer trust obligation. My sense is if, we, if you have a program that you feel reasonably confident demonstrating to your end customer, like we did with the Privacy Center last year, and you get good press, you get good feedback, you see the numbers working out correctly, there is an opportunity not just to depend upon a specific framework, but to influence future iterations of that framework as well. Because I think like too often we depend upon the framework to come and have this grand epiphany and tell us exactly what to do. I think the traffic needs to move both ways and say, not here's the frameworks we use, and here are the frameworks that got improved because of our actual contribution. It's time we in the tech industry stood up and said, here's how we can do things better. And not just by waiting for some compliance regime to fall upon our head, but to say, here's things that should actually improve because our customers say so, because they prefer a privacy-centric, privacy-favored solution. And they made us do it. We did it for them. And here's the way to make the framework better for everyone in the industry. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, I think uh, initially, uh, you, you know, even the whole concept of privacy by design was very aspirational. And people mm -hmm. said, OK, yeah, I, I, I like it. I buy it. But but how do I do it? And exactly. and, you know, we need to basically roll back in our experience into the frameworks. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking here at, um, there's like a blizzard outside my window here in Pittsburgh. Wow. It's, it's quite exciting. <laughs> All right. Um, if I may uh, add one more thing uh, to yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, though. I think one challenge uh, that I feel, okay, I mean, we are from three pretty large uh, companies, but if we are thinking about uh, the industry or all the different uh, sectors or organizations, one challenge that I uh, see is that the talent pool in this field is pretty limited at this point. And it's uh, it's pretty hard for uh, many companies, other than a handful of companies, to afford this talent and to be able to be able to make a huge amount of progress uh, societally. I think uh, we need to train a lot more people who are adept in these uh, in this field as well. Yes, we need to train more privacy engineers, um, which is what yes. I do. <laughs> Come to Carnegie Mellon and, um, and do Can privacy I engineering. <laughs> yeah, and I would love to keep that going because I like I like to hire your engineers, uh, Dr. Greener. They're fantastic. <laughs> but I mean, the point where you wouldn't buy a car without a seatbelt, you wouldn't buy a home without an inspection. Why would you ship something without privacy controls, right? So let's train privacy engineers, but let's let's also train non-privacy engineers in privacy a little bit as well. Let's train privacy attorneys on how tech stack decisions are often made. Let's have engineers understand why laws are passed the way they are passed. Because these laws are getting passed because someone somewhere doesn't like the fact that the tech industry has behaved badly, right? So having these connections happen is pretty critical. So making it part of people's normal way of doing business and making it symptomatic of just the normal desirable way of life is pretty critical. Like I was T-born pretty badly two years ago. And if not for those seatbelts, I would have died. Almost certainly would have died. The car was smushed completely. And those seatbelts and those airbags saved my life. Privacy should be like those seatbelts and airbags. Yeah. I, I maybe bringing a slightly different perspective from 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 the AI world. So I think privacy de design is um, looking back. It essentially it's bringing me more transparency into what is happening with my data around like processing and storage of data and everything. Now. If you translate that to where we are now with uh, machine learning models, for example, so privacy is usually an afterthought, and uh, and, and we later try to fix it. And I've mentioned this this black box, and I think very similar things are required in, in this field to make um, uh, people who develop AI systems more aware of how do we actually integrate privacy um, and, and and enable similar mechanisms as we have in in. in uh, more traditional privacy by design in, in the new field as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so while we're talking about technology, uh, actually, uh, Victor, um, why don't you tell us about some of the new developments in privacy enhancing technologies that you're most excited about? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there there's a lot of things you can be excited about and, and, and a lot of things going on, but I, I think one 
thing to be aware of that, that there's not really a silver bullet. I mean, every technology has its uh, has its trade-offs. Uh, we have to choose from. Um, I mean, people often. I mean, people often like differential privacy is, is is cited commonly as an industry gold standard, but it has its limitation in particular on um, uh, vulner like um, includes an of uh, minorities, like which um, DP exposes general generalization, but it's not good in, for example, bringing um, demographic minorities, so they can be uh, impacted in a, in, a, in a not so great way. Um, if I want to call out one, so we, I mentioned we have to do a trade-off. So one thing I want to call out here is a privacy auditing, because I think that's generally underexplored in in, uh, in, in the privacy world and, and, and in regulation. So there's a trend in academia uh, emerging, which is how do we quantitatively measure privacy risk in machine learning pipe, pipelines? So in, in any processing of data, if you release an aggregate statistics and machine learning, deploying a machine learning models could be seen as a similar way of um, releasing an aggregate statistics, uh, there is a risk attached to it. And even the GDPR realizes that there could be, uh, the, the guidance realizes that there, that there is a residual risk potentially there. And um, this branch of research allows us to really quantify this residual risk in a, for a particular scenario under realistic um, adversarial assumptions. So um, we can, for example, compare which which privacy enhancing technology works best in a particular scenario or which combination works best in a particular scenario and make trade-offs around uh, utility and privacy, um, in particular around corner cases. Yeah. So, and when you talk about the trade-offs um, being compared, that that would be something that the engineers would do, um, as opposed to uh, like end users being able to figure that out. Yes. So, I mean, yes, the the engineer, so the 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 engineers or the people developing the AI systems can can um, choose between trade-offs, but we can also, if we have quantitative measures, we can communicate the actual risk. We can communicate the trade-offs. And be transparent in what we do, and by that also increase trust in our system. Anyone else want to jump in with a favorite uh, development in privacy enhancing technologies? Um, I, I can. I'm sorry, I let you go. <laughs> go ahead, Chovic. It's uh, somewhat aspirational as well. We have we are making some progress in that direction, but we are far away from my aspiration in this uh, particular area. See, I think the way that data processing architectures have evolved is uh, saying that, hey, let's get all the data together, do a lot of processing, join with that, group by this thing, and okay, here is we get the data. And then uh, our data scientist thinks about that end product of the data processing and runs analysis and machine learning models and uh, whatnot to, to derive some insights for that if that's going to help business or that can help uh, members in, so, in some ways. But what I would uh, love to be in a state is say, we are not doing all that processing of the data. The data lives where they are, closest to where they're generated, but the useful information from that data only that gets uh, taken out and uh, insights that we want to derive, we we form from or aggregate and form those from that. Like So federated learning is taking us in that uh, direction, but we are pretty uh, far from that. And once, so if I have to summarize this, maybe uh, say it in a form that take uh, compute to the data instead of bring data to the compute kind of framework. And, in that uh, in that setup, maybe the data lives in the devices or silos and whatnot, and we can tightly control what information goes out, what uh, privacy guarantees can we provide on the information going out of that data, and all of that. So, the governance in that world will be a lot higher than where we are today. Okay, Nishan. Yeah, the only thing I would add is one of my worries often is. The data is always changing. The availability of other stuff on the dark web is always changing. So understanding how you can make decisions with the data is going to be a decision that is a mix of intuition, judgment on the one side, and deterministic values on the other. 
So how do you use every technique available, whether it's perturbation, differential privacy, uh, K-anonymity, and diversity? How do you continually update that based on lineage, based on past learnings, and then make decisions based on that specific data use case on an ongoing basis at scale? And for that to happen, you have to have these tools working across the board. So the tech, it's not a specific technology. It's about making sure that you your decisions around sharing or deletion or any other things should be based on that particular unique data set as much as possible because the ability to make those decisions at the table level or the data set level or even the warehouse level is pretty risky because as we have seen multiple times there is just too much contextual change happening all over the world with secrets in code with credentials in the dark web there's just too much variability so driving that decision down at the data data level is going to be pretty, pretty, pretty critical so that would be sort of a new approach to technology that I would bring to the table. So, um, what about the uh, the user side of thing? I, I can't help but keep coming back to users. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, we now have privacy laws that require you to get uh, consent for all sorts of things or to allow people to opt out of all sorts of things. And so you have to throw a user interface up. Is there anything that you're looking at to do with privacy enhancing technologies so that you can minimize how often you have to throw up these, these interfaces uh, to users? I guess I can go first. I think some level of centralization is pretty critical. So I remember Dr. Kraner, when I was at CMU for a speech a few years ago, I showed them all these dashboards that my team had built to give consumers a sense of here's what we have about you. Here's how you can change things. And it was interesting when, when I had tested those dashboards against focus groups at my current place of employment at the time, we got very good feedback, like great design. Of course, these were people who were on site. They had just eaten their food. Maybe they, they said nice things to my face because we were on site. So the expectation was, we, we were on to something great. And a couple of your students came to me after the fact and said that you have so many dashboards, it just tells me you have so much data about me. So people will ask questions, they may not ask the questions that you want them to ask. So I think there is a trade off here where to what level do you want to offer clarity where it confuses people? And at what point is it stopping them from actually asking reasonable questions versus making them concerned? So how do you make sure that people can make decisions at the individual decision level that is do this or don't do this rather than these catch all banners that people just click through or these big dashboards that confuse people how do you make make available those insights to your users when they're about to make a pretty critical decision like should i should i show you ads based on tracking across the web or should i show you ads based on what you bought a couple of weeks ago so making sure that you make some judgment calls about who it is on the other side what data is it what the derivative of that data is, and what decision is it going to drive. I think that's going to train not just your models inside the company, but also your customers to give you insights that they genuinely care about. I think that's a better model between, it's like a nice happy medium between the catch-all, do not sell my data banners that people have gotten used to, versus these major dashboards that make no sense of someone like my dad who just wants to get on the app and order a movie or something. Anyone else? I'll add that uh, it's uh, uh, probably uh, some twist to the, the framing of the question. I think it's uh, not about uh, taking the, the choice. The members have the choice, but uh, it's to a point that uh, they have the choice if they want to get define what their preferences are. But if they don't have a choice, that uh, baseline state is also a very good one. I think that is uh, something that, uh, you know, like, I think we are working uh, towards as well. And there are many situations where uh, we have added, uh, like, uh, differential privacy guarantees in many parts of our product, and be it uh, machine learning models or be it, uh, uh, say, uh, the analytics that we are exposing uh, uh, to others and also in in this uh, in this operations we are looking at mechanisms where we attack ourselves to get a sense of what risks our our members might be at and use those insights to look at okay these are places where we can improve these are some higher priority than others and use those in the judgment to to think about how to invest in areas Sounds good. Um, Victor, do you have anything you want to add? Um, not much, but yeah, I, I think agree. It's it's a fine balance between it's not an it's not a decision of like say all in or all out, but it's a fine balance of enabling sufficient control 
but also not overwhelming the user. In particular, systems are evolving quickly and uh, and, and are getting more complex. And uh, so it's interesting to see how, how, how this is going to evolve. Okay. All right, so I think we have time for one more topic. Um, and I wanna talk about how we sell privacy in the company. Obviously you all are totally on board to privacy, but how do you get your managers and your peers and people in other parts of the company on board? Uh, we'll start with Nishant. Yeah, so the way you do that is to take privacy out of the conversation. I know it sounds somewhat counterintuitive, but I like to find out who else is hurting and who else is suffering the same pain I'm suffering. The platform folks who have to multiply Re, multiple times restate the clusters, the ML folks whose queries time out because they there's so much data, or the ML other ML team whose insights are crap because the data is out of date. Find them in the company. They exist. They complain loudly. They speak normal people English rather than privacy English, right? Have them make the case that the volume of data is killing us. The size of data is too damn high or whatever it is that they say in New York these days. So identify these people and tell them that we have a common place here to sort of have some shared ground. I have been able to get resources for privacy in multiple companies by being in the room but not saying a word, which considering how much I talk might be hard to believe, but there are actually examples of that happening. So identify other stakeholders and use them to say, okay, here's how much money we save. Because what the board of directors and what the C-suite loves is efficiency, productivity, and of course, good compliance. Compliance comes third in that list, but all three are pretty critical. So make the case for privacy being a sort of an entry point on a Trojan horse to achieve those other business maturity, financial security goals. And from a career perspective, that's, that's the same spiel I give to the engineers. You working in my team enables you have to have some expertise at the platform level. So you can be full stack, front end, back end. You can have specialization in data. You can have specialization in UI. So if you want to try something totally different down the road, you won't be pigeonholed into this one particular domain area. You can't just be an iOS engineer. You cannot be just an Android engineer, right? When the economy gets tight, the people who are the most prosperous are the ones who can show a lot of flexibility, not just technically, but from a business perspective. So whether you sell privacy to the board of directors or whether you sell privacy to engineers who you want to come work for you, it's the exact same argument. It's a way to make other amazing things happen besides doing the right thing, besides helping the company, and besides being truthful and transparent to the end customer, which is in the end for me, what this is all, the whole thing's about. Great. Uh, Victor, do you want to tell us uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, my role is less about uh, um, selling privacy or, or people convincing to do it. It's, it's more about uh, education on what is the right technology, what can we do, and uh, what should we, how should we, what what should we consider. And so, so I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this, but uh, I would say in general, I'm in a, in a, in a very good position that uh, we have a lot of buy-in into our agenda overall, and it's it's really about the education aspect. Yeah, it helps when you're in a company that you know has already embraced the idea, and there's a, and you're not the only one uh, yeah. pushing for it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Shovik. Yeah, I think uh, both. Uh, I mean, all of you have already covered this uh, to a large extent. I mean, uh, uh, at a high level, it's uh, it's a value add to business in most situations. That's one uh, one way to go about it, and the other thing is. In most situations, it's the right thing to do, and uh, I, so those things together in account, I don't really have to do a hard sell. One reason for that also is that at uh, LinkedIn, uh, one of our core values or core principles is being members first. That means do the right thing for our members and customers, and using that lens with that angle, um, it's often an easy conversation. The the challenge, as I mentioned. Uh, oftentimes is the how, how we go about it, what is the right technology to apply or the right mechanisms to bring in and how to talk about that with the with our members and customers in the right way. Those become the challenge, challenging aspects and not the selling part per se. Yeah, and I imagine that there's a lot of, um, yeah, privacy sounds great to everybody. Um, and, you know, and so at first you, you've got buy-in. Of course, we want we want to provide privacy. We're a good company. Um, but then there may be some very specific situations where providing more privacy comes up directly um, against some other thing that you're trying to do. You know, we, we have this idea for this new product or service and it needs a lot of data. And, you know, the the... It, it may need data that 
ideally we wouldn't have or that we would be protecting in a different way. Um, and now we have to figure out how to provide this thing without the data or while protecting the data in some creative way so that we can still use it for what we need to use it. And that's where it gets complicated, right? Yeah. Yes, true. And I'll say that the, no, at, uh, at all our uh, large companies, there are way too many of those. And it's uh, we'll all get exhausted if we uh, try to uh, search out and uh, and or fight those individual situations one by one. And that's where I think uh, a better approach is probably to make sure that uh, the company culture is uh, is taking this uh, is incorporating this aspect and setting up values which make it easy to make uh, decision making. And at that point, uh, the decision making can be distributed. That makes a lot of sense. Maybe maybe one point to add is like in particular in in in, in coming from the privacy enhancing technology aspect. I think technology needs to be really easy to adopt. Uh, I mean, we have talked about the uh, leadership side, but now we were talking about the engineer point of view. Um, technology needs to be simple to adopt. Otherwise, people are hesitant to 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 use it. And I think that's something super critical to focus on. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree, and and I think by easy to adopt, I, I think that's at all all levels that um, easy for the end users, but also even easy easy for the engineers who are not privacy experts to be able to actually adopt the privacy enhancing technologies in in their part of the system. Um, yeah, I mean sometimes it's hard to even explain to an intelligent engineer what uh, some of these privacy enhancing technologies are and what they do and how they work. Um, let alone get them to want to build it into their their piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and what does epsilon equal to 20 mean? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out a good way to explain epsilon to people who don't already get it. Um, so, that's why uh, that's exactly why I brought up the the privacy auditing as a technology I feel really excited about because this allows us to um, um, the quantitative measures, which are much easier to 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 digest and to interpret than than than, than the epsilon, for example, what is the one property we measure is what is the membership inference at advantage? What is the probability I can detect if my data has been used in this for for, for training of this model? And I, I think mapping to map, mapping mapping epsilon to simps to understand properties I can communicate is is super valuable. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, I want to thank you all for a really fun conversation, which hopefully was informative to our audience, too. Um, and I will hand it over to Lisa. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Lisa will join us in just a bit, but I wanted to thank Julie so much for joining us today uh, for our last session of our uh, Data Privacy Week event. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. And I've been listening to the earlier presentations and boy, what what really great speakers and great content. So I'm delighted to uh, be able to participate as well. Great. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump right in and hopefully Lisa can join us in a moment. But I uh, just wanted to start out uh, by talking about how Microsoft operates all over the world and provides products to consumers and uh, enterprises. But we'd like to know, what are you hearing from your customers? What are their most pressing privacy concerns today? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I, I really think it's important to think about different types of customers and different types of expectations and needs. So I tend to think about uh, our customers uh, in terms of individuals, consumers, um, as well as employees. And then separately, I think about commercial customers. Um, and with respect to consumers first, look, they are uh, t telling us and are expressing everywhere that they have heightened expectations. They really expect a lot of uh, companies, particularly large companies that have a lot of resources. And they want us to be aware of um, their needs. They want to understand the value of their data and they want it to be protected. Um, so they're asking for us to develop services that will keep them safe, will keep their children safe, that will provide them with more control over their data and basically allow them to function online uh, pretty much the same way they function in real life, which is that they have control over their lives. 
Um, with respect to commercial customers, um, what, what they are seeing, I think, primarily is a complex regulatory environment that involves not just privacy, but a lot of other issues, which we'll talk about hopefully in a few minutes. And they want us as one of their key partners to help them navigate uh, this very complex environment through our products, our solutions, and, and other guidance that we can give them. So, you know, they're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. We're in a rapidly evolving dynamic time for organizations. Lawmakers and regulators want to address complex problems for those individuals that I talked about a moment ago, for consumers, for people. And so, so lawmakers and regulators are thinking about the impact of technology on so, uh, and social media, uh, as an example, on kids. They're thinking about advertising and what is advertising doing in our ecosystem and so much more. So with multiple parliaments, multiple Congresses, multiple state houses, all developing solutions to some of these issues for companies, it's an, what we're facing and, and we're facing writ large and then what Microsoft is facing as one of the core centers of this ecosystem is trying to digest and understand this complexity, make it more simple and helping companies navigate this space through product solutions and through um, internal approaches that they can take. So your colleague Chris mentioned earlier in the event that privacy is really growing, and I know you have a broad regulatory overview, not just privacy, digital safety, and AI. Can you talk a little bit about what we should be paying attention to in the broader landscape? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that is really important to pay attention to first is not just the requirements that are being developed, but also the expectations that our customers and the broader group of stakeholders that companies need to engage with have today. Um, when we first think just about sort of the, the uh, regulatory landscape um, and, and broadening out a bit our, our aperture, including privacy, but also other issues, um, as one uh, uh, place to stop first on the map would obviously be the European Union. They will continue to lead on an, in a number of regulatory areas. People in Brussels, policymakers, regulators, and in the European Union more generally, are proud of the seminal uh, privacy regulation that they've created, GDPR, and how it is being um, analyzed and adopted in various ways um, around the globe. Um, but they're also now grappling in Brussels with um, some perceived gaps in GDPR and also addressing issues that GDPR was really never designed to address. And that's where we're seeing things like the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which are two important examples of this next wave of, um, of regulation. These laws, uh, the Digital Services Act is designed to address online safety and harms and the D Digital Markets Act is designed to address competition concerns, particularly stemming from companies that serve as gatekeepers, gatekeepers to markets that other companies want to access. So both of these laws, Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, do touch on privacy issues, for instance, advertising, but they are much more immer immersive, much more comprehensive in terms of the issues that they, that they do address. Now, the EU is also focusing on um, AI, and there is an AI uh, act that is in development. It takes a different approach than, than GDPR um, and even than the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act. The um, AI Act in its current uh, form is looking at AI from a safety perspective, founding a lot of its concepts on product safety concepts. But there's a lot of discussion underway. That law is still in development. And uh, I think it'll be a little while before we see final adoption. At the same time in the United States, as you mentioned, my colleague Chris covered a lot of the laws that are under development with respect to privacy at the state level in the United States. What we're seeing in terms of AI is regulators 
um, and the administration stepping in to develop frameworks for thinking about responsible AI. So you have NIST and you have the um, OSTP within the administration developing frameworks there. But I think it would be really unfair to only focus on, the, on Europe and the United States. We need to think globally about the kind of immersive laws that are um, under discussion elsewhere. And I think there's no better example than India. The Indian, the India government or the government of India is advancing what they're calling a comprehensive legal framework for its entire digital ecosystem. So we will see um, rules around personal data. We will see rules around non-personal data. We will see a number of other um, uh, elements of this approach, this framework that the India government is is addressing. And then there's so much more happening in South America, Australia, Canada, and um, in African nations. So this is going to be a wave of regulation that is going to be looking at AI, digital safety, security, privacy, in a complex manner and in an immersive manner. So, um, you know, uh, uh, companies are going to be are going to need to think about expectations for sure of their customers and, and individuals, but they're also going to need to pay attention to this evolving and immersive environment that is, uh, is right at our doorstep. And on that note, how can a U.S. company change its perspective on global norms? And from your experience, uh, what are some of those uh, best practices? Yeah, you know, when um, you're a company like Microsoft, you know, we create technologies that can really change the world. And we need to ensure that the technologies that we're creating are used responsibly. So what we think about, again, is we obviously uh, want to ensure that we are complying with the law um, and that we are helping our engineers understand how they build compliance into their products right from the beginning. In addition, because we are also very focused on expectations of our customers um, that go above and beyond uh, the law in order to really um, develop products in a responsible uh, way, what we do across our domains, across our key domains around privacy, responsible AI, uh, digital safety and security is we start with principles, internal principles that we want to live up to including um, what regulatory requirements are out there, but also going beyond. And we build those expectations into internal standards. And those internal standards then become implementation guidance for all of our engineers throughout Microsoft as they're developing products and as they're developing solutions. So, you know, we have just as an example of some of these internal standards and guidances, we have an AI uh, responsible AI internal standard. We have um, a privacy internal standard on responsible AI. We are uh, focused on ensuring that we that our solutions, our technology that uses AI will have a positive impact on society and on people. With respect to privacy, we are guiding our engineering teams to focus on data use, how we're using data, how we're being transparent about data, how we're building in controls across our ecosystem to meet, again, regulatory obligations, but also our customer expectations. And in some ways, to get to really at the heart of your question, you also need to think about the culture inside companies. And you know, one of the lessons that we learned at Microsoft what, especially when GDPR was launched, was that we needed to really embrace, in the instance of GDPR, the EU's concept around uh, not just regulatory issues, but really around personal data. What is personal data? Um, in the United States, we've, we've long had a concept of PII, um, personally identifiable information. In the European Union context of GDPR and personal data, it's a much broader concept. And so really beginning even before you get to principles and before you get to standards and expectations, you also need to think about the culture and you need to think about how you infuse our solutions with an appropriate cultural approach. And so thinking more, much more extensively about what personal data is, speaking with European regulators and some of our key customers in Europe, we gained that understanding and infused from the very beginning our principles, our standards, 
our implementation guidance with that cultural lens as well. Great, and we have one more question before we wrap up, but 2023 is going to be a pivotal year in privacy. What do you want viewers to know about privacy at this very moment in time? Yeah, I'd say first for consumers, for people, um, engage with digital technology on your own terms. You know, use tools and resources that are available to you to control and understand where your data is going, who's seen it, and uh, uh, in, it just engaging uh, uh, on those decisions. Have strong passwords, use two-factor authentication because you can't have privacy without security. Um, limit the permissions and the privacy settings on the apps. Really look at the portals that you are that you have and really take a look at, at, at who's, who's engaging with your data. And you know, if you don't like it, stop it. Um, also, really work with a trusted partner, work with trusted apps, work, work with trusted uh, uh, systems because they will all be providing you with these kinds of tools. For businesses, really quick for companies, I would really, um, uh, I do tell all of our customers that I have the um, privilege to engage with to recognize their responsibility to all of their stakeholders, not just their customers, but also think about your communities, think about employees, think about governments, think about civil society, and of course, think about regulators. And then, and then as you're uh, doing all that, define the principles of what you as a company want to stand for to establish your trust and your trustworthiness across all of those stakeholders. And develop these frameworks about how your teams, your internal teams, your compliance teams, as well as your product teams will then uh, enable and make real those principles that you set for yourself. And finally, work with providers who get this and who understand the journey that you're on, the complexity, and help, helping you solve the complexity and making it making things a little bit more simple and coherent for you. That's great advice, Julie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I just want to thank also all of our speakers and everyone for tuning in today for our event. And a special thank you to Microsoft and Optiv for supporting Data Privacy Week and these events. Please be sure to visit the National Cybersecurity Alliance at staysafeonline.org, where you can find year-round privacy resources. Uh, you can stay up to date on new resources and upcoming events by subscribing to our newsletter or by following us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Thank you all again for joining us today and happy Data Privacy Week.